Good morning, South Point family. You see, I don't have a partner today, but I'm so glad you are here with me today. So my name is Gabby. I am part of the team here at South Point, and we are truly so glad you're here. Whether you're watching this on YouTube, on Facebook, or for the best experience, go to southpointforyou.com slash live. Go ahead and tag a friend and share this on all your socials so that more and more people can come and share the good news of Jesus, you know, with us today. If you are, whether you're coming in for the first time or you've been coming for a while, make sure you fill out the connect card. It's going to pop in in the chat, or you can also go to southpointforyou.com slash connect. It let us know that you're here, and it also helps us to be able to get you connected with our community so that you can, you know, be a part of us. Um, so today is Father's Day. Whether you are a father or you're a father figure for somebody, we all want to wish you a happy very happy Father's Day. Today we're also going to do child dedication. That is also very exciting to see all the kids running around in church. We also want to let you know um, that we're going to have a night of worship that is going to be Friday, June 28th at 7 p.m. here in the building. You guys, that day we're not going to offer church online. But if you like worship, if you like music, come on in. Um, find a friend, or if you're shy, you know, just reach out to us, and we will be very glad to walk in with you. Come on in. Also, today we are continuing our sermon series called Won't You Be My Neighbor. I've been still singing that song, and after the first service, I'm still singing that song. <laughs> but... Today, we're going to hear from Pastor Jen. And so before we jump into the service today, let's talk, let's look at what Jesus says in John 13, 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Let's go ahead and join the worship now. Joy to be glad, rejoice 
we take this time to say happy Father's Day. You are father to the fatherless. And so we say, come on, come on, happy Father's Day. God, we love you, we thank you, we need you. God, would you have your way in this place? Would you have your way within us on today, God? God, open our ears to be able to hear what you have to say on today. Open our hearts. God, we need you like never before. God, we pray right now for Pastor Jen. We pray that she might be encouraged that she is chosen by you, that she is loved by you. Oh God, we're in expectation of something incredible because you are God. And so right now, God, we just thank you with all of our hearts. We say happy Father's Day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Well, happy Sunday, church. Good morning. I don't know about you, but I think that's a phenomenal way to kick off our Sunday morning. We're being reminded that we are children of God. Welcome to church. My name is Tracy. I'm part of the team here. And if this is your very first time here at South Point, welcome. If this is your very first time tuning in online, welcome. We are thrilled that you are here. If you would take out your phone and if you would text the word welcome to this number, 240-297-7400, we want to get to know you. We want to help you get connected and plugged in here at South Point. We also have a first time guest gift for you. So text the word welcome to that number on the screen. Also to that same number, whether you're new here or you've been coming for ages, do you know that we have a weekly email that comes out every Friday with every detail about what's going on at South Point Church on Sundays and during the week and coming up. And so if you want to be plugged in to know what's going on, you can text the word news to that same number, 240-297-7400, so that you always are on top of what's going on here at South Point Church. If you are a father, and, or if you are a father figure pouring into the lives of those around you, we want to wish you a happy Father's Day today. Thank you for who you are and for how you love. Um, church, on Thursday, our youth group, our middle schoolers and high schoolers, are going to Big Stuff Camp. They're going to Florida. And so if we can be surrounding them with prayer while they are away, both the students and their leaders who will be getting no sleep at all. Uh, So from June 20th to 26th, if we can be lifting up um, the students and the leaders in prayer that God would move in their hearts in a big way uh, this coming week. We have a night of worship coming up on June 28th at 7 p.m. Yep, and so this will be a time of extended musical worship, uh, and we highly encourage you to come and participate um, because sometimes the taste that we get on Sunday morning is just not nearly enough, and so we will have a time of extended musical worship. We will have childcare from birth through fifth grade that night on June 28th. And if you um, would like to be a part of all of these things that South Point is doing. The way that we can do these things is because of the financial generosity of those who call South Point Church their home. And so if you would like to um, make some of these things happen, if you would like to be a part of that, you can always um, give at southpointforyou.com slash give. I think those are all the things I was supposed to say. So turn your attention to the screen. A holy stewardship, a precious opportunity, a divine calling, a parent. Parenting isn't just about babysitting and potty training. It's not just about teaching them to ride a bike or tie a shoe. It isn't just about making lunches and brushing teeth. Parenting is about changing the world. It's about reminding our kids who they really are, children of God, born for his glory. So parents, let's remember that the most important meetings of your day aren't in a conference room or on a stage, but at the dinner table and at the bedside. Let's remember 
that there's no quality time without quantity time. That the most valuable thing is not what you leave for them, but what you leave in them. That every time they fall down, you have the responsibility and the privilege of lifting them back up. Remember that your kids don't need you to be popular, productive, and certainly not perfect. They need you to be present. And remember that every time you wipe away the tear on their cheek, you're giving them a glimpse of the day when God himself will wipe away every tear forever. The Bible tells us to train up a child in the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not depart from it. So show them the way, pray for their soul, and give them your best, because God gave you to them. saying um, look at all these amazing families up here can you guys give them a hand this is amazing I'm so excited for every single one of you guys up here today uh, my name is Brie Barber I'm the South Point preschool ministry director here at South Point Church good morning guys my name is Jen Curtis I am the family ministry pastor here at South Point Church and we just want to take a moment and say thank you so much for joining us for child dedication today we at South Point believe um, that it takes more than one influence to help raise a child to follow Jesus. And so if we can widen the circle, if we can put other families in these families' paths, if we can put other adults in these kids' paths to help them um, grow closer to Jesus, parents need a community. And congratulations, we're the community. Awesome. All right, to add on to that, our goal is to stand with these families to say to them that we are here for you through all of the amazing times and all the hard times. Uh, as a church, we will partner with you, offer resources, build community, provide consistent people in your child's life at every stage, um, and cheer you on. Uh, we wanna thank each family for being here and making the child dedication today our priority. Thank you guys so much um, for prioritizing kids and student ministry. Uh, that is a high quality of ours here at South Point. We don't do babysitting or childcare on the other side of the building. We do ministry at every age because we know that every kid learns differently at different phases of their life. And so thank you for your partnership. Thank you for volunteering in kids and student ministry. Thank you for your financial partnership. We couldn't do it without you. And your generosity is what allows us to reach more and more families each year. Absolutely. Okay, at this time, we're going to ask the families three questions. Families, after each question, you're going to respond with, I do. After that, Pastor Jen is going to ask the church three questions in which you're going to respond with, I do. And if you're joining us online, please go ahead and just drop an I do in the chat. All right, parents, do you commit to follow Jesus personally so your child can see a model of what faith is to look like in everyday life, not just on Sundays? Do you commit to each other as parents to create a safe and stable place for them to grow? If married, would you commit to your marriage? Do you commit to provide, protect, and point the whole of your child, physically, intellectually, socially, emotionally, and spiritually, to God through Christ? All right, church, if you could bear with me for a second, I'm going to ask you to please stand. I'm going to ask you three questions. Child dedication isn't just about families, it's also about us as the church. So I'm gonna ask you three questions. After each question, I would ask that you say, I do. And then after that, if you would remain standing for a corporate prayer. Church, do you commit to follow Jesus personally and to support in public what these children will see modeled at home? Do you commit to support through prayer, friendship, and the local church, these parents and families? Church, do you commit to provide, protect, and point the whole of who these kids are to God through Christ? I do. Thank you. All right, join.
turn to me in prayer, please. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for this amazing day and for every single family that's here on stage and in the audience. Uh, God, I'm just so thankful that uh, we're all here together just praising you um, on this beautiful Father's Day. God, I just pray that each family up here uh, just feels a sense of community and just knows that we are here to walk alongside them as they raise up our next generation. God, please partner with these families and help us partner with them too as they um, just create these faith developers and um, raise their children up to honor your name, God. Thank you so much and happy Father's Day to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, at this time, families, we're gonna walk um, straight out the lobby and you're welcome to check your kids in and then come back so you can enjoy the message. After service, pick your kids up and we will gather on the uh, back end of the lobby and we'll do individual prayer with your families, okay? Thank you, everyone. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day Since we're together we might as well say Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Good morning, friends. How we doing? It's a party. You guys, I'm so pumped um, that child dedication aligns with the series, Won't You Be My Neighbor? We, um, if you've spent any time alive in this world, you know that like we just can't do it alone. And so I'm excited to bring you week three of this Won't You Be My Neighbor series. Week one, Pastor Kyle talked to us about being a neighbor to like our physical neighbors in our neighborhoods. Last week, Pastor Tracy talked to us about we just got to learn to love everybody always, not just when we want to or when we agree with them. Today, we are going to talk about um, how to be a neighbor and what that practically looks like and how do we do that. And so... One thing that I've learned in life is the significance of doing life with others. Here at South Point, one of our core values is life is better together. And that is something that I have tried to live through and through my whole life. Um, I've been married to my husband, Charlie, for 24 years, I think. It's not my, (laughs) dates aren't my thing. We have four amazing kids together. They range in age from 16 to 23. And um, when my second child, about two weeks before he turned one, we were living in Florida, we had friends, we had a family, we lived in a neighborhood, and we moved to Maryland. And it was amazing. I've been here for 20, almost 21 years. Um, but what I learned through that transition was that we weren't made to do life alone. Um, When we lived in Florida, I had community, I had friends, I had family nearby. When we moved to Maryland, we lived on a farm, not an animal farm, a tree farm. And the trees aren't very good neighbors. I don't know if you guys know that or not. Um, In Florida, my husband was on a thing, he was in the Navy. He was on this thing called sea duty, which means that every other year he was gone for nine months. And I was like, this just is not the life I'm made for. So we moved to Maryland, and he's on this amazing thing called shore duty, and that means that he is home every night. So we were so pumped we get here. It's just our family of four. We're going to start our life, 
And we quickly learned that the program he was supporting was supporting airplanes that weren't in the fleet yet, and they were all in Washington State. So not right side Washington, but left side Washington, like a whole planet away. So here we are in Maryland. I live on a farm with a whole bunch of trees. I have two little kids. I have no friends. I have no family. And now my husband is gone two weeks at a time, every two weeks. And I quickly learned that that is not the life I was made for. And so this was pre-social media days. This was pre-Facebook and MySpace and all the social media that we have today. Um, And so I had to learn real quick how to build community because driving back and forth to Florida every two weeks just wasn't cutting it for me. My two weeks here were not fun. They were miserable. I was alone. And so I learned then that you can go online. There was, at the time, there was this thing called Yahoo Groups and you could make play groups. And I made a lot of friends. And I, like, I'm still in community with these families today. We still talk to each other. We text all the time. And my kids today would tell you, if you ask any of them, they all have someone in their life that they would consider their second mom. And so I learned early on, I don't want to be the only influence in my kids' lives. I want other people to pour into them. I want my kids to have other people to talk to because, quite frankly, I don't want to know everything my kids do, and they don't want to tell me. And so they have other adults that we trust and know that they can talk to. And so one thing that I've learned in life that I'm pretty sure that all of you are familiar with, um, and statistics tell us that this one thing is true. You guys, we're all suffering from this word called loneliness. This isn't something that I made up. This is something that um, a couple years ago, the Surgeon General came out the Surgeon General of the United States. This isn't some small person. And they said this right here. We're going to put it on the slides. And it's this. Our epidemic of loneliness and isolation has been an underappreciated public health crisis that has harmed individual and societal health. You guys, it's an epidemic of loneliness in isolation. We're all alone. We all feel lonely. And the one thing that we want, the one thing that we crave, is deep, meaningful relationships. We want friendships. We want to be in community with other people. It's why we spend hours scrolling on social media, not every week, but every day because we want to be connected. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the next slide says, you can feel lonely even if you have a lot of people around you. Because loneliness is about the quality of your connections, not just about the people that you interact with. And so when I spend time scrolling on social media and you spend time scrolling on social media, and we see all these people and they're out having fun with their friends and their lives are perfect, it causes us to think, you know, friendship might be for other people. It's definitely not for me. Or maybe you think, what's wrong with me that I don't have any friends? Everyone else has friends, but I sit at home every evening by myself watching everyone else have fun. It also causes us, when we leave our houses, to put this smile on our face and everyone that we encounter, hey, how are you doing? I'm great, I'm fine, how are you? How's your day going? It's great, I'm fine, how are you? It's almost like we're living in this show where everyone that you meet has this smile on their face and their response is, I'm fine, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? We're not fine, guys. I'm not fine, you're not fine. If you're watching online, we're not fine. And that's okay. And so today we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a neighbor? What are the steps that it takes to have these meaningful relationships? And I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I'm not that smart. These aren't my ideas. Uh, We're going to jump into the Bible. We are going to talk today about a story in the Bible that we've probably all read 500 million times. Maybe not quite that many, but more than once. When I tell you what the story is, you're going to know it. But today we're going to take this story and we're going to look at it in a way that I hope you've never seen it before. 
that you can see that sometimes what we see isn't at face value, isn't all that is there. And so we're going to jump into Mark chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 tell us this. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. You guys, the house was full. There was no room for anyone else. If you drove to church this morning and the parking lot was full, what would you do? I mean, I might go to Starbucks and then go home and take a nap, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Um, So in this story, we're going to hear about some friends who did some amazing things, and we're going to go to the next slide. Some men came. The house is full. You can't get in. Don't forget that. Bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Notice they didn't say they put the paralyzed man in the car and drove him to Jesus. They carried him to Jesus. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered the mat that the man was laying on. So they showed up to church and there was no parking. And you couldn't even get in the front door. So they did what any other reasonable person would do that's going to church and can't get in. They climbed to the roof, right? You guys are going to do that, right? Um, So they get to the roof, and what what do we do now? Oh, let's dig a hole. And so they remove the mud and the clay, and imagine what it's like sitting in this house. There's got to be stuff falling from the ceiling, right? Like, there's got to be things happening that are taking the focus off of Jesus, and everybody's going, what's happening? All of a sudden, here comes this guy, and he just lands ever so gently. They lowered him. They didn't drop him. They lowered him at Jesus' feet. Next slide says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Notice it doesn't say when Jesus saw that the man couldn't walk, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. He didn't say, you know, son, you have prayed your whole life for this, and the time has finally come, you're healed. Nope. Jesus looked at the crowd. Jesus looked at the man. I'm sure the man looked at Jesus and was like, hey, I'm here. What are we doing? And then Jesus looked up at the roof, and he looked through the ceiling, and because of their faith, when he saw what this man's friends had done for him, this man. He said, your sins are forgiven. You can get up and walk. If we jump forward one book in the Bible um, to Luke chapter 5, verse 18, the same story, um, just worded a little bit different. Um, and sometimes I think it's fun to look at the different stories through the different authors, the different lenses of who saw it happen. And so Luke tells us, some men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Next slide. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they did what everybody else would do. They went to the roof, and they lowered the man on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. How many of you, if you climbed the roof of this building right now, could lower someone right at my feet? Zero, right? It doesn't work. So we don't know all the details of how this happened, but what we do know is that this man was paralyzed. He could not walk. His friends said, hey, there's a guy that can heal you. Let's go see him. And they took him to Jesus, and Jesus healed him. Goes on to say that he stood up and walked out, Jesus told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been laying on, and went home praising God. This man went to see Jesus and couldn't walk. 
and walked home because of what his friends did for him. Today, we're going to jump into um, what it means to be a neighbor. And the first thing that it is to be a neighbor is that being a neighbor has a cost. It's not free. It always costs us something when we do life with other people. What did it cost the four men that carried their friend? They might have gotten a seat inside the house, but they had to carry their friend, and so that slowed them down. They didn't have a car. And so being a neighbor had a cost. It might be a financial cost. You guys, having friends are expensive. I've got like an amazing inner circle. I love them with all my, every fiber of my being. And sometimes one of my friends and I look at each other and we go, we were doing our budget and like, we spend way too much money on each other. Um, the inflatables that Pastor Tracy talked about last week, those things aren't cheap and they're not free. When you have a friend who's had a baby and you deliver them dinner, or you have a friend who is going through a hard time and you take them dinner, there's a cost to that. And so friendship always has a cost. Being a neighbor has a cost. There's also the cost of time. The guy, the man on the mat, he slowed his friends down. When our friend calls us and says, I'm having a really bad day, can you come sit with me? It takes your time to sit with them. When we sit with others in their pain, it costs us our time. It takes time to pray for other people. The other thing that neighboring costs us is it costs us our image, our mat. You see, when I'm in authentic community, in authentic friendship with other people, I have to let them see that I'm not perfect. And when I let others see that I'm not perfect, that I'm no longer perfect in their eyes and I no longer have this image. It is so much easier to Google our problems than it is to call our friend and go, life is hard and I don't know what to do. And so this image that it costs us is very similar to the mat that the man was laying on. He was open with his friends. I need healing. Healing isn't happening. Can you take me to Jesus? And so neighboring has a cost. It costs us our finances. It costs us our time. And it costs us our image. But you want to know something else about neighboring? It's also a two-way street. We have to take care of our friends, but we also must be willing to receive care. And I don't like that part of that sentence. Here's something that I've kind of wrestled with this week. I think we all tend to default to one or two stances. I think you're either naturally a mat carrier where you wanna help other people and you wanna do things for other people. Or by default, you want others to carry your mat and you ask other people to carry your mat and you're comfortable with that. And I think that's amazing. I'm horrible at that. And so, you need your mat carried? Great, I'm there. I'm your person. Call me all day long. I will do anything for you. What can you do for me? Nothing, absolutely nothing. I'm fine. Everything's great. Right? No, no need for that. I'm good. I got it. My life is all put together. Just don't ask my friends or my family. Um, there's this thing I learned that, um, because I like to care for other people, you could be a professional caretaker. Like, it's a job. You could care for other people. And so I think sometimes we want friendship and we go, I'm caring for all these people. I'm caring for all these people. I'm caring for all these people. But we're unwilling to let people care for us. And in order to be a neighbor and in order to live in community, it's a two-way street. We have to carry our friends' mats, but we also have to be willing to let others carry our mat. Uh, that's also not something that I made up. That's something that Jesus modeled very well. Um, one of the like most revealing scriptures about Jesus is found in Matthew chapter 26, verse 38. And Matthew is, uh, not Matthew, Jesus. Jesus is the guy. Uh, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's hard. They just had the Last Supper. He knows what's coming. And he sits down, and he tells his friends, 
My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. This is Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man. And then Jesus tells his friends, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. If Jesus can be this open and honest with his friends, why do we, just mere humanity, feel like we have to have it all together? I'm great, I'm fine, everything's wonderful, have a good day, right? It's not what Jesus modeled. And so are you being open and honest with your friends and your neighbors? Fun story. Uh, this has not been my favorite year of my life. Life has, um, feels like it keeps knocking me down over and over and over again. And a few months ago, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning one day, and I was like, I'm having a heart attack. This is the end of my life. And I was like, well, what do I do? So I do what any normal person does who actually thinks they're having a heart attack. I went and I laid on the bathroom floor because that makes sense, and I woke nobody up. And so I lay on the bathroom floor, and I'm like, oh, this cold feeling feels good. This helps. Hmm. I must not be dying. So I move on. This starts happening to me about three days a week over the course of about four or five weeks. And I'm like, pretty sure I'm dying. So do what any normal person does. I go to my best friend, Google, and I'm like, Google, I'm dying. What's wrong with me? And Google says, hey, you're not dying. You're having panic attacks. And I was like, oh, it's amazing. I'm having panic attacks. I'm not dying. So I go to my friends. It's like my inner circle. These are the people that know literally everything about me. Guess what, guys? I'm not dying. And they're like, what do you mean you're not dying? And I was like, well, for like six weeks now, I thought I was dying. Like, I actually thought, like three days a week, I was going to fall over with a heart attack. And my friends, and I thought they would be like, that's amazing. We're so happy for you. You know what my friend said? You were the worst friend. No, nope, didn't tell us. Do you remember that mantra we live by of like, it's okay to suffer and it's okay to struggle, but we don't let friends struggle alone? You forgot that. And you defaulted on our friendship. So no, we're not happy that you're not dying. We're a little bit frustrated that you didn't trust us enough to tell us this. Because I had forgotten the key that neighboring is a two-way street. And sometimes you're the one carrying the mat. I've carried all my friends' mats before. We've done lots of hard life together. But I forgot that I also have to let them carry my mat. I can't do it alone. So here's point three. And this is where a pastor Matt would tell you to buckle up. And if I'm brutally honest with you, I don't want to say these words out loud. And this week, as I was wrestling through this message of like, oh, what am I going to say? I feel like I need a third point. You always have to have a third point. God was like, hey, guess what? You're going to say this. And I was like, oh, oh, oh. no, I'm not. He's like, yep, you're going to say this. And I was like, not me, God. That's somebody else. We got two more weeks of this series. Somebody else can say that. And God was like, ha, ha, let's go, buttercup. You're up. So here it is, point three of neighboring. And I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but you're all going to be hurt. Neighboring means exclusion. You guys, we can't be friends with everybody. And in order to have a real and authentic friendship with some, then by default, that means that we can't be friends with everybody. It means that people are going to feel left out. Um, in student ministry, one thing we talk a lot about is we want to do for a few what we wish we could do for all, okay? I, I can love a few people really well. I can love all people, not at all, even though Pastor Tracy said we should. Um, but I put this um, image up here on the screen, and it kind of talks about friendship circles. And I want us to take a minute and have an honest, like, internal dialogue about this right here. You've got yourself in the middle. And that next row out, those are your close friends and your close family. 
I don't know what you call your friends. I call my friends a squad. We do life together. We do real life together when I decide to be honest. Um, not, you know, not great at that. Then you have your regular friends, and you have your acquaintances, and then you have your professionals. So as I was thinking about this, I was like, what's a good way to categorize my friends? And so I thought, here's a good way. If you called me and said, hey, Jen, I'm in your driveway. I want to talk to you. Can I come in? If you're on my inner circle, if you're my close friends or my close family, doors open. Come on in. Let's go. If you're in that next circle out, I might be like, oh, I'm just getting in the shower. Give me 10 minutes and I'll let you in. And in that 10 minutes, I'm going to mad dash pick up my house and I'm going to get my family in order and we are going to look put together. If you're an acquaintance, I might ask for 20 minutes. If you are someone that I don't know very well, I'm probably going to not tell the truth and be like, oh, I know my car's at home, but I'm not at home. I am out in town. So can we catch up next week? Okay. So when you think about your friends, where do they fall in this category? And if there's no one that you would let walk in your house with a five-second notice, then you need to make someone in that circle. You need to build a relationship with someone so that they become your close friend, your close neighbor, so that they see you for who you really are. Uh, This wasn't my idea. This was something that Jesus did. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane with his friends, he was with Peter, James, and John. And those were, like, that was Jesus' squad. That was his inner circle. And he did things with them that he didn't do with the rest of the disciples. Um, So when he revealed his heart that my soul is sorrowful, I'm anguished, he said that to his closest friends. And how many of your close friends know when your heart is full of sorrow and when you're anguished? Do you let people in? So now that we've talked about all the people we're not going to be friends with, um, Kind of what, what does this practically mean for all of us? What do we do with the information? How do we change this epidemic of loneliness? I know you're lonely. I'm lonely. Like, it is a fact of life. And so we just feel this over and over again. And so Genesis chapter 2, verses 18. Um, back in Genesis, God has created the whole world. And everything he created, it is good. Create the animals, they're good. Create the land, they're good. I know I didn't get that in order. Please don't come at me. Um, But God created man, and it was the first time God had said, it's not good. And it wasn't that man wasn't good. It was that man was alone. And so Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God says, it is not good for man to be alone. And that was the first time that something wasn't good. So, back to the Surgeon General. How do we solve this? Like, that's a whole lot of sadness and frustration, but guys, there's hope, and we're going to get there, all right? So we're going to go back to what the Surgeon General says, and what he says is this. While the epidemic of loneliness and isolation is widespread and has profound consequences for our individual and collective health and well-being, there is a medicine hiding in plain sight. I told you that I could cure your problems just like that, you would take that, right? It's not that easy, but it's here and it's available. And I think in today's fast pace of life and the way that we're living, we have forgotten this. And so the medicine that is hiding in plain sight is social connection. Notice it doesn't say the medicine is social media. And it doesn't say the medicine is superficial, I'm fine, everything's great, relationships. It says social connection. Notice it doesn't say playing Fortnite online with your friends all night long. That one's for my kids. Um, The cure for loneliness is connection. And so you go, hmm, what does connection mean? You're all wondering that, right? So glad you asked. I have the definition right here. You ready for this? Connection is when two or more people interact with each other and each person feels 
valued, seen, and heard. There's no judgment, and you feel stronger and nourished after engaging with them. Connection is when you feel valued. Connection is when you feel seen. Connection is when you feel heard. When you leave these interactions with people and you have connected, you feel stronger and you feel nourished. After you've scrolled Facebook for an hour and a half for the third time today, do you feel seen? Do you feel heard? You scroll Instagram stories. Do you feel valued? When you scroll on TikTok, and I think on TikTok after two hours, you get that, hold up, you've been scrolling too long, put your phone down and take a break. When you get that notification, do you feel stronger? Do you feel nourished? I think we've forgotten how to connect with people. I work with teenagers quite a bit, and we always say that this is the loneliest generation that we've ever seen. But also, as their parents, we're lonely. As other people in society, we're lonely. We don't have a lot of people that we spend time with that value us, that see us, that hear us. And we don't have a lot of people that when we leave these interactions, we feel stronger and we feel nourished. And so what are we gonna do about that, you guys? Good news. I have a super simple solution, and when I tell it to you, you're just gonna be like, whatever. Um, but it's so basic. But what it starts with is texting a friend. I want you to text one person this week, and I want you to ask them to go have coffee with you. Coffee's kind of a no strings attached. There's a lot happening in coffee shops. Um, if you wanna get fancy, you can go out to lunch with someone. You can get fancier, you can go out to dinner. Um, but text one person and go, hey, I've been thinking about you. Let's go grab a coffee together or a tea. You don't have to drink coffee. They're probably not going to say no because it's not just you that's feeling lonely. It's not just me that's feeling lonely. It's every single contact in my phone and every single contact in your phone. And so we're going to ask a friend to coffee. When we get to coffee, we're going to be honest. And when they say, how are you doing? You're not going to go, I'm fine, I'm great, everything's okay, have a good day. You're going to go, life's hard. I had an argument with my husband last night. He was mad because, again, I left the dental floss in the shower. And I left an eggshell in the sink. And he, but he's put up with me for 24 years, so we're just going gonna to be okay with that. We're going to be real. We're going to be honest with them because honesty is what's missing. And the last thing we're going to do when we meet them for coffee is we're going to be vulnerable. We're going to be real. We're going to tell them. When they say, man, I don't know what to do with my teenagers. The school called. They got in trouble again. You're going to be like, oh, me too. I thought I was the only one whose teenagers weren't perfect. Because they're not perfect. And social media wants us to believe that they are, and they wants us to believe that our kids are the only one facing things. Social media wants me to believe that I'm the only one that sometimes argues with my spouse, and that sometimes my kids talk back. Every day they talk back. Um, but guys, we have forgotten the importance of connection, and so. My hope and my prayer for you this week is that you will take these three 
simple steps. It's super basic. It's just a text message. You guys, it's 2024. We don't even have to call them. You don't even have to hear their voice. Send them a text. Hey, I was thinking about you. Let's grab coffee. If you're feeling fancy, you might offer to buy it for them. Otherwise, they might buy yours. And so be brave. The only way that we can change the current of this loneliness situation is to take a step and to build authentic relationships and learn to be neighbors to our friends in our community. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just, um, God, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us. God, we thank you um, for the opportunity um, to make change, to be change makers in the world, to, um, to build community in a season of life where it feels like there is no community. God, we just um, ask you for bravery. God, we ask you for guidance. We ask that you would put the person in our path that we need that can carry our mat, that can take us to our miracle and to our healing. God, we just love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Church, will you stand with us as we worship?
we come together and praise the name of Jesus. There's a shifting in the atmosphere. Will you lift your voices as we continue to sing his praise?